Nearly a year ago, I pulled apart my base model 5K iMac, I gave it a higher end CPU, I upgraded the memory, and I added some extra internal storage. At the end of it all, I had a faster machine than what Apple sold, and I saved over $1,800 in the process. So naturally, the minute I purchased my base model iMac Pro, I had people clamoring at my door asking me to upgrade it as well. And so here we are. This video was made possible by Dashlane, the best password manager around. Need proof? I've been a paying user since before they ever thought to sponsor the channel. Go to dashlane.com slash snazzy labs to try it out for free. Do it. Go. iMac Pro, while a beast of a machine, is actually a pretty good value. Now, hold on, my keyboard warrior PCMR friends. I know, yes, you could obviously build a PC using prosumer hardware like an Intel i9-7980 Extreme Edition and, I don't know, an NVIDIA GTX 1080 Ti that would smoke even the most expensive $10,000 iMac Pro and for significantly less money. However, if you build a PC spec for spec using similar workstation hardware, buying a base model iMac Pro is actually cheaper than building a comparable PC, especially when you factor in the stunning 5K display, which irrational PC fanboys always conveniently forget when drawing conclusions. Now, the argument that most Apple haters will make is, well, nobody in their right mind would choose the hardware that Apple has for iMac Pro. And while that may be true, it doesn't change the fact that the iMac Pro is still cheaper than building a nearly identical PC, especially when you get one during one of the frequent sales like I did for $1,000 off the $5,000 price tag. This also meant, however, that saving a ton of money on a balls-to-the-wall upgrade like I did last year with my 5K iMac wasn't going to be likely. I did the math, and buying a base model iMac Pro, upgrading the CPU to the 18-core Xeon variant, and bumping my ECC memory up to a colossal 128 gigabytes saves me a grand total of 400 bucks. Which is not worth the risk of possibly damaging a nearly $10,000 computer, especially when you can't even really get it friggin' fixed if you accidentally break something. Sorry, Linus. Now, technically, you do save more than $400 because you end up with an extra CPU and 32 gigabytes of DDR4 ECC memory, which you could sell on eBay for about $1,700 total if you're really lucky. Then, if you add an extra $1,000 off on the frequent sales that go for the base model $5,000 iMac, you're looking at about a maximum savings of $3,000. And again, that's only if you're really lucky and the stars align perfectly. Now, $3,000 is not nothing, but is it worth voiding the warranty on a $10,000 new, unpredictable machine? Uh, probably not. <clears throat> so then what the heck is this video about? Well, I'm going to upgrade my base model iMac Pro, but instead of jumping from the stock 8-core CPU all the way to the 18-core, I'm just going to upgrade to the 10-core model, which is widely considered the best value in all-round performance. If I do that, my savings will be... Five bucks. Eh? Now, don't click away. There is a method to this madness. You see, Intel created special CPU SKUs specifically for Apple and for iMac Pro on both the 8-core and the 10-core configurations. The model numbers have the letter B at the end. And if we take a look at the 10-core model, the W2155B for Apple, the chip is downclocked a whole 300 megahertz from the stock chip, the W2155, that Apple sells to normal people. Why? Well, I don't know, you may think heat, but both chips have the same TDP, and the cooling assembly in iMac Pro is the same, whether you get the 8-core or the 18-core chip. And this is just a 10-core, so it shouldn't matter. It shouldn't be heat, at least. I really only have two guesses. Number one, and this one seems the most likely, lower bin quality allows Apple to save money on cheaper chips that would otherwise be rejected by Intel, uh, all the while keeping the clock speed a little bit lower and therefore allowing the fan curve to stay a little bit quieter. Classic Apple. Or number two, the wimpy 370 watt power supply inside iMac Pro can't handle supplying adequate juice to a CPU, Vega GPU, and power-hungry 500-nit display under full load and peak brightness. So the question is, can you even use a regular 10-core Xeon CPU in an iMac Pro? Technically, I should be able to because it's the same chipset, but nobody in the world has tried it, and it is not a supported CPU. And if I can get it to work, are there any performance gains? Well, let's find out. First, I need to take the screen off my new NeverVesa-mounted iMac Pro. However, I'm going to need to find something that will prevent the display assembly from jostling about. How about... Uh, ooh, this Galaxy S8 Plus. I knew I would find a use for this thing eventually. That was a joke. It's a great phone. <laughs> Calm down. 
Now I need to use the handy iFixit iMac opening tool to cut away the tons of sticky tape that holds the screen in place. And uh, this process takes a while. But with enough gentle prying, the display finally separates just enough for me to yank the display cables and ooh, wow. Why, Apple? Why do you have to make the inside of a computer that's glued shut that you don't ever want us to see look so friggin' sexy? Now that we've removed the two blower fans that cool the entire machine, we can pull out the motherboard, which thankfully, unlike the previous iMac, uh, can be removed without pulling the power supply or speaker assemblies. A fun fact, the plastic black Apple logo on the back of the machine serves as the Wi-Fi antenna. The more you know. On to the motherboard. You can see here we've got the removable memory dims, the copper heatsink, which is connected to both the CPU and non-removable BGA soldered Vega 56 GPU, uh, by unremarkable cooling blocks and heat pipes. Temps on this machine are okay, better than Apple's normal affair, but still not great, and now I can kind of see why. We've also got a view of the two proprietary PCIe 512GB SSDs that run together in RAID 0 to create a single 1TB drive capable of a whopping 3.3GB per second write speed. And that's all controlled by the new ARM-based T2 chip, which handles hardware security and boot security on iMac Pro. Now it's time to remove the stock 32 gigabytes of RAM so that we can finally remove the cooling assembly. And, oh crap. Well, I guess we better end the video here, guys. I don't want to avoid the warranty. As we pull the cooling assembly off, we can see the metric crap ton of thermal compound that Apple applies from the factory. Uh, and hey, look, we even get a free thermal paste covered fingerprint from the factory worker. See, you get your money's worth. There's also surprisingly, and perhaps a little frustratingly, a little thermal paste that made it to the underside of the CPU that was haphazardly wiped away from the pads. Ugh. Now, with a little prying, I'm able to unstick the CPU from the block and holy Batman, look at all that excess thermal paste. Looks like this is the same garbage that I found in my MacBook too. Look at this, this computer was manufactured in April. So what's that, two months ago? And the thermal compound is already almost rock hard. I seriously, I don't understand why they use such crappy thermal paste. Better stuff would cost like a penny. Anyways, out with the old and in with the new. And let's see how this new 10 core beast performs. That is if we can get the computer to boot. Side note, this AMD Vega 56 GPU is just stunning. It's also inconveniently permanently attached to one of the world's most expensive motherboards, so hopefully that thing never breaks. But before we put it all back together, let's not forget the RAM. All 128 gigabytes of it. Yeah, baby! Now each individual stick has as much memory as the whole computer did just a few moments ago. Holy smokes, that stuff is pretty, and holy smokes, it is totally super overkill. I don't need that much RAM, and hardly anyone does. Heck, it costs half the price of the machine, but I'll be darned if it doesn't look pretty good. Once I apply the extremely sticky and strong adhesive strips that hold this display in place, I've got one chance to put it on right, and there are no clips to help secure it in place, so I've gotta just eyeball the thing and hope I can get it right. And look at that. I may be an idiot Mac user, but holy smokes, I nailed that install. But will it boot? Again, I think I'm the first knuckle-headed idiot on the internet stupid enough to put an unsupported CPU inside this machine. And after an uncomfortably long moment of waiting, these Xeons take a while to boot, aha! Uh -huh, it boots just as it should. Not only do all 128 gigabytes of RAM show up, but so does the CPU. All 3.3 gigahertz of it. Awesome. Now it's time for the important part, benchmarks and real world performance. Now, just for your reference, I'm comparing all of these benchmarks to the stock 8-core machine that, well, I just pulled apart, as well as my friend's 10-core machine, also configured with 128 gigabytes of RAM, but from the factory, from Apple, untouched. In Cinebench, and ooh, baby, this thing flies, the results between the snazzy 10-core and Apple 10-core are nearly identical. Ugh. Well, that's not great. Luckily, in Geekbench, it's a much different story. My single-core score was nearly 10% better, and my multi-core score was a whopping 9% improved. In fact, it actually surpassed the average multi-core score for the 14-core iMac, while obviously crushing that machine in single-core results. 
Real world benchmarks are where it really matters, however, and in the Snazzy Labs Final Cut Pro 4K export, my machine does not disappoint, with a 7% faster export than the 10 core iMac Pro. So, there you have it. I built a 10 core iMac Pro that outperforms Apple's by 7 to 10 percent, all while saving five dollars in the process. And you see, that's the problem. iMac Pro is a very expensive machine with a very shallow support network. And if you're going to go blow a bunch of money on a workstation grade computer, you should probably steer clear of avoided warranty and just play it safe. Speaking of safe, Dashlane keeps your passwords safer than safe. I've talked about some of the amazing stuff Dashlane can do in previous episodes. You know, cool stuff like their one-click password changer and their killer mobile app autofill functionality. But today I want to talk about a lesser known Dashlane feature and that's Inbox Scan, which you can find in the Mobile Apps Tools section. This is a killer utility for new users and it gives Dashlane one-time access to your email account. It logs into your email and then it'll search for all of the online internet accounts you've ever created provide you with a security analysis that categorizes your logins and allows you to add said logins to your Dashlane account, all in one click. Features like these make Dashlane a no-brainer. They've got killer mobile and desktop apps for every major operating system, and they help you both organize and secure your digital life. Try Dashlane today for free by going to dashlane.com slash snazzylabs. And when you decide to sign up, save 10% off your purchase by using the coupon snazzylabs at checkout. Well, folks, that's all from me. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. If not, well, then that other button seems to work okay too. Get subscribed for more awesome tech videos like this one. Check out some of my other awesome stuff over here, but most importantly, and as always, stay snazzy.